Good evening. Good evening. Hope everyone is doing well tonight. Uh, Ken was far too gracious in his comments. He said, uh, he says, I do everything. I don't do gymnastics. I don't, I don't do that. Um, no, it's a joy to be with y'all tonight. It truly is. This is my third time here. And uh, every time I've come, I've really, really enjoyed it. This is the biggest crowd I've seen thus far for one of our services. So thank you to everyone who has come. Let's go to the Lord in a word of prayer, and, and we will begin. Father, we're grateful for this time that you've given to us. Uh, we thank you for the good weather, undoubtedly, that has drawn and allowed more people to come tonight. Uh, we pray that, that you would go with us tonight. I uh, pray that, that your word would be handled rightly, that uh, we would come to understand more of the evil system that is set up against you. Um, by this world, uh, that we will know what is going on and we will be ready to give an answer for the hope that is within us, that we would be ready and willing and able to stand on the sufficiency of your word to answer all of these uh, evil ideologies that are coming out that would seek to dethrone you. And these things we ask in, in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Okay, well... Let us begin tonight. Um, there we go. So I've been asked to speak on social justice tonight. That's a huge, huge topic. But to focus primarily on CRT, critical race theory, and intersectionality. Uh, these are two components of the social justice movement. The social justice movement is, in my estimation, the most severe, acute, and concerning threat, uh, to use that term, that has wreaked havoc in the evangelical world. Uh, there are a lot of different threats. Now, when I say threat, we, of course, as Christians, understand that Christ is the head of the church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. But nonetheless, uh, Satan does have his schemes. Satan disguises himself as an angel of light, right? And he would seek to cause confusion and division within the body. And there's a number of different threats uh, to evangelicalism today. You've got the seeker-sensitive movement, the uh, belief that churches should look like the world to attract the world and cater to the world. You've got that. You've got the prosperity gospel. You've got the word faith, new apostolic reformation movement, uh, hyper-charismaticism, all of this. You've got liberal churches uh, that go so far as to deny the deity of Christ. You've got all of these different threats. But, but what is unique about the social justice movement is that unlike the Word of Faith movement, NAR, unlike liberal uh, theology, the social justice movement has picked off people, some heavy hitters, within our tight theological circles. Uh, for example, the Word of Faith movement, NAR, that kind of stuff, you've got people, even in the best of churches, the most sound churches, you'll have a smattering of people that, uh, to one degree or another, might listen to uh, a Joel Osteen or, um, Paula, or Paula, well, Paula White, yeah, Joyce Meyer especially, some of those kind of folks. But we've never had any of the heavy hitters in our movement, the leaders in our movement, actually teaching Word Faith, NAR hyper-charismatic stuff. But with the social justice movement, we do. With the social justice movement, it has picked off some of the more well-known names, preachers, within our tight theological circles. And that is what is extraordinary, extraordinarily alarming. So let me define the social justice movement. Social justice movement defined is a political in philosophical concept, which holds that all people are entitled, note that word, entitled, to equal access to wealth, health, well-being, justice, and opportunity within a society. That all people are entitled to these things. These ideas find their roots in Marxism. Marxism is basically communism relabeled. Marxism holds to the state ownership of the means of production in a classless society, that there should be no uh, super wealthy or poor unless you're one of the leaders in Marxism, then you can be super wealthy. 
but nobody else should be. Everybody else, the rest of society, aside from the elite ruling class, everybody else should look just the same. And socialism, which is the path that this country is on, leads to Marxism. Make no mistake about it, the United States of America is on a direct path to socialism. If you are a member of the Democratic Party, at least at the national level, you are a socialist. And socialism leads to Marxism. Uh, socialism has been described as communism in diapers. It's just baby communism. But the funny thing about babies is that babies don't stay babies, do they? Babies grow up. So socialism left unchecked always leads to full-blown communism. And the social justice movement for the evangelical world is a political movement disguised as a theological movement. It's disguised as a theological movement to make inroads into the evangelical voting bloc. Evangelicals, of course, have for decades voted overwhelmingly for the Republican Party because the Democratic Party is so antithetical to biblical tenets. And so the social justice movement is a political movement, a Marxist political movement that is disguising itself as a theological movement to make inroads into the evangelical world to break apart that voting block and funnel more votes to the Democratic Party. And it's not that people in the evangelical social justice movement, it's not that they are flat out denying the fundamentals of the faith. It's not that they're, now again, within our movement, within our circles, they're not denying that the Bible is the word of God. They're not denying the deity of Christ, not outright. But anytime you say the gospel is about is salvation by grace alone, through faith alone, and Christ alone, plus something, whatever follows that plus gets all of the attention, right? So the social justice movement is saying, well, yes, the gospel is salvation by grace through faith in Christ, but it's also all of these other things, plus these other things. And whatever follows the plus gets all of the attention. And what gets forgotten? The gospel the gospel gets forgotten. But you need to understand that the social justice movement, I want to have a few slides here. Um, social justice movement is rooted in Marxism. Socialism always leads to Marxism or full-blown communism. But within our movement, the social justice movement can be thought of as a train. So when you have the engine of the social justice Movement, it's bringing some cars along with it. Okay, and tonight we're going to be looking at the economic cars and the racial cars. And there are also, are, are also the egalitarian cars, and we'll talk a little bit more about that, Lord willing, in my presentation Thursday night. But the belief that women can preach, women can serve as pastors, that's the egalitarian car. That car is coming along with the engine of the social justice movement as is the homosexual car. That car is connected to this train too, and it's coming in. So once the engine of social justice gets inside of your church, know that all of these cars are coming along with it. It is a package deal. So let's look a little bit at the economic car. The social justicians today argue that the Bible advocates for socialism the equalization of wealth redistribution, that the Bible actually teaches this. And they have a few texts that they use in support, and I want us to look at these together. One of these is Mark chapter 10. Social justice proponents would look at Mark chapter 10, and they say, see, this calls for socialism. This is the rich young ruler. Beginning in verse 17, and as he, Jesus, was setting out on a journey, a man ran up to him, knelt before him, began asking him, good teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus said to him, why do you call me good? No one is good except God alone. Jesus, by the way, was not correcting him. He was leading him, saying, do you understand what you, you're saying when you call me good? Because no one is good except God. Jesus was affirming his deity. But then Jesus said to this man, you know the commandments. Do not murder, do not commit adultery, do not steal, do not bear false witness, do not defraud, honor your father and mother. 
And he said to him, Teacher, I have kept all these things from my youth up. And looking at him, Jesus loved him and said to him, One thing you lack, go and sell all you possess and give to the poor, and then you will have treasure in heaven and come follow me. Social justice promoters look at this and they say, See, Jesus told this man that if he would sell everything that he has, give it to the poor, then he'll have treasure in heaven. This is socialism. But dear friends, that is not at all what this text is teaching. They argue that Jesus was telling all Christians to sell everything that they have and give it to the poor. But Jesus was not speaking here to all Christians, was he? He was just speaking to one man, a lost man at that. This is not an address to all believers. And Jesus was not teaching, of course, a work salvation. Jesus was zeroing in on what for this man had become his God, and that was his wealth. That was his wealth. Anything that we put before Christ is idolatry. The problem that this young man had, who we call the rich young ruler, the problem was not his wealth in and of itself. The problem was his idolatry. He was an idolater. That was the issue. And Jesus was saying, that thing, that thing that is most important to you, in the case of this young man, it was his wealth. Jesus said, get rid of it. Get rid of it. And then come follow me. This is not advocating socialism or a work salvation. Two other texts that the social justice proponents point to. Acts chapter 2, 44 through 45. And you may have heard of these texts used in this way. Acts 2, 44 through 45. And all those who had believed were together and had all things in common. And they began selling their property and possessions and were dividing them up with all as anyone might have need. And upon first blush, it might would seem, wow, that sounds pretty socialistic to me. These Christians were selling their property, selling their possessions, and, and dividing them up amongst the believers. That, that sounds pretty communal, pretty socialistic. Acts chapter 4, 34 through 45 in, a, 35 in a similar vein. For there was not a needy person among them. For all who were owners of land or houses would sell them and bring the proceeds of the sales and lay them at the apostles' feet, and they would be distributed to each as any had need. So, doesn't this sound like socialism? Well, maybe upon first blush, but dear friends, this giving in Acts chapter 2 was voluntary giving for the Christian community. The Christians were not being told to do this. The government was not telling them to do this. They did this on their own. Socialism is forced upon people more often than not at the end of a gun. That's not what was going on here. They weren't being forced to do this. They just voluntarily decided to do this. And Ananias and Sapphira in Acts chapter 5, you might remember, Ananias sold a piece of property and kept some of the possessions for himself with his wife's full knowledge. And then the apostle Peter confronted him. And then Ananias and Sapphira were slain by the Spirit. Charismatics talk about being slain in the Spirit. They were slain by the Spirit, right? They dropped dead. And dear friends, Ananias and Sapphira, the Holy Spirit of God did not kill them because they kept some of the profits of their property that they sold. That's not why God killed them. God killed them because they lied about it. They lied about it. Not simply because they kept some of the proceeds. Their sin was lying. That's why God killed them. Not a very good way to grow your church, you know, when that, that kind of thing goes on. Not very secret sensitive. But notice the tense here in these texts. It says that all those who had believed were together and had all things in common, and they began selling. They were selling their property and their possessions. They were selling. This is an imperfect tense. They didn't just sell all of their property and possessions one time, and they were done with it. It says they were selling their property. This was an ongoing thing. This was an action that began at some point in time, but then it continued. It continued. So think about it. If they sold everything all at once, everything that they had, then the selling could not have continued, right? The very fact that this selling, this process continued, shows 
that they still had personal property to sell, right? This was an ongoing thing, not a one and done. So they still had private property. They did not sell everything that they had. The picture here in Acts chapter 2 and Acts chapter 4 is that they, as they saw the need, they would sell things to meet that need. They weren't being told to do it. They did it on their own. The Bible consistently assumes the private ownership of property. The Bible consistently assumes the private ownership of property. Otherwise, the eighth commandment, thou shalt not steal, wouldn't make any sense. If God's people were not to own anything or anybody, if, if people were not supposed to have private property, then how could you steal something? If everything was owned communally, everybody owned everything, and if the, uh, what's that guy's name that says, uh, you will own nothing and be happy? Schwab, Schwab. If, if Schwab was right, you'll own nothing and be happy, well, then that means that there would, you couldn't even violate the Eighth Commandment. So thou shalt not steal assumes private ownership of property, as does the Tenth Commandment. Thou shalt not covet. You can only covet something if someone owns something that you do not yourself own. But if you don't own anything, if nobody owns anything privately, then there's not even the opportunity to covet, right? So the Bible assumes the private ownership of property. Some social justice proponents would also point to Luke chapter 16. This is the rich man and Lazarus. The rich man and Lazarus. Uh, the rich man had everything that the world could offer. Lazarus had absolutely nothing, both of whom died. And they'll say, well, the rich man died and he went to hell because he was rich. Lazarus died and he went to heaven because he was poor. Dear friends, that is not the point of the text at all. Each man went where he was spiritually prepared to go. There's nothing inherently wrong with being wealthy, nor is there anything inherently honorable in being poor. Each man went where he was spiritually prepared to go. The Bible does not teach socialism at all. These, these texts that the social justice proponents point to have to be wretched out of their context, turned on their heads to make them say something that they emphatically do not say. The Bible does teach giving. 2 Corinthians chapter 8, 2 Corinthians chapter 9, the Bible does teach giving. We are commanded as Christians to give, but we are not to give under compulsion we are not commanded to even to give a certain percentage, and that gets into issues with tithing that's beyond the scope of the sermon. But we are commanded to give as a reflection of a grateful heart for what God has done for us. What God has given us, he has been so generous, so kind to us, and we are to give as a reflection of a grateful heart for what he has done to us. And I would add this as well. Galatians chapter 6, verse 10. The Apostle Paul says, So then, as we have opportunity, right, not under compulsion, not because we're ordered to, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all people, especially to those who are the household of the faith. So as Christians, we are to give, but we are to give especially to the household of the faith. My concern, the people that I want to help most, are not people out there in the world lost. Though I would help people and, and do from time to time if I see a need and opportunity to present the gospel. But my first concern, the first people that I'm going to help financially and with any of the resources that God has given me are people within the household of faith. Right? Okay. Now, I want us to look at reparations. This is Dr. Eric Mason. Dr. Eric Mason is the uh, pastor of Epiphany Fellowship Church, and he's written a book entitled Woke Church. Uh, Eric Mason is a huge proponent of the social justice movement. He, along with another guy named Tabidi Anyabewe, he's another big uh, social justice proponent in fact, Tabidi, both of these men are pastors, but Tabidi and Yubewe, ironically, 
just uh, 15 years ago in 2008, preached strongly that race is not something over which we divide. In fact, there's really only one race, the human race. He rightly said that. Uh, he talked against, really talked against the social justice movement. That was in 2008. And then he got blown about by the winds of the social justice movement. He began to imbibe that poison. And then just 10 years later, in 2018, he is telling white people that we, as white people, we must repent of our whiteness. If you're white, you need to repent of being white. Tossed to and fro, carried about by every wind of doctrine, by the trickery of men, to beat he was. Eric Mason, sadly, the same way. Eric Mason began as a sound pastor and theologian, but now he is anything but. 2018, he wrote this book entitled Woke Church. He preached a summer sermon in 2020 in which he called for monetary reparations to be paid to black people for what he described as, as I, and I quote, 256 years of free labor with nothing but poor eating and poor places to stay. And he cites as his support Exodus chapter 22, verse 21, which says this, If someone steals an ox or a sheep and slaughters it or sells it, he shall pay five oxen for the ox and four sheep for the sheep. That's one of his texts to support reparations. But dear friends, that is not at all what this is talking about. The Bible says if someone, if someone steals an ox or a sheep, he is to repay it. So, you, in other words, you are responsible for your own sin. I'm not responsible for your sin. You're not responsible for my sin. That, is, that text is not at all talking about reparations. Also, amazingly, he goes to Luke chapter 19. Zacchaeus, watch this clip of a sermon from Dr. Eric Mason. Watch this. Um, we're diving into a particular piece today. We're diving into reparations. We'll talk about that in a second as we read the text. We're going through Luke chapter 19, verses 1 through 10. I want to talk to you today from this text. I want to tag it, a biblical case for reparations. A biblical case for reparations. Let's go before the Lord. Lord, shower your grace and blessings on us, Lord God, as we dive into this text. Shower your grace. Check, check. Shower your grace. Can y'all hear me? All of a sudden I can't hear myself. He says, shower your grace upon us, Lord, as we go to this text, Luke chapter 19. What an arrogant thing for him to preach, to pray. Let's look at Luke 19. Zacchaeus, beginning in verse 5. And when Jesus came to the place, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, hurry and come down, for today I must stay at your house. And he hurried and came down and received him gladly. And when they saw it, they all began to grumble, saying, He has gone to be the guest of a man who is a sinner. But Zacchaeus stopped and said to the Lord, Behold, half of my possessions, Lord, I will give to the poor. And if I have extorted anyone of anything, I will give back four times as much. So Dr. Eric Mason takes the story of Zacchaeus, and he twists that text to make a case for reparations from the Bible. Again, this is not at all talking about reparations. Zacchaeus had swindled people, and when he was confronted by Christ, the Holy Spirit of God moved on Zacchaeus' heart, convicted him of his sin, and then Zacchaeus said, Lord, half of my possessions I will give to the poor, and if I, have, if I, I personally have extorted anyone of anything, I will give back four times as much. Notice that Jesus didn't even tell him to do this. He just did it on his own. What made him do that? Nothing other than the Holy Spirit of God regenerating his heart. This is, this is the fruit of repentance. This is the good fruit that comes when God saves someone. Zacchaeus got saved right here. How do we know that? Well, Jesus said to him, Today salvation has come to this house. He got born again right here. 
and as an expression of a grateful heart for what God had done for him, he was, he was convicted of his sin. He was convicted. He knew that he had swindled people, and he wanted to make it right. This was restitution, not reparations. Restitution, not reparations. He wanted to make it right. This is the good fruit that is born from a heart that is regenerated by the Holy Spirit of God. It's not about reparations at all. And folks, let me tell you, if that is any man that could get reparations out of Luke chapter 19, has no business preaching the Bible at all. At all. But if you want to deal with reparations, if you want to go to a text that actually does talk about reparations, well, let's go to Deuteronomy chapter 15. Deuteronomy 15, beginning in verse 12. If your brother, a Hebrew man or woman, is sold to you, then he shall serve you six years. But in the seventh year, you shall let him go to be free from you. When you let him go to be free from you, you shall not let him go empty-handed. You shall furnish him generously from your flock and from your threshing floor and from your wine vat. You shall give to him as Yahweh your God has blessed you. This is actually talking about slavery. And a slave would serve six years. In the seventh year, he was to be freed. But when he was freed, he wasn't to be freed and just say, See you later. Hope things go well with you. No, the owner of that slave was to give to him generously from his flock. This is a direct one-to-one correlation. The one who has sinned against another should make that sin right, should pay restitution, just like Zacchaeus did, as an expression of a grateful heart. Dear friends, again, I am not responsible for your sin. You are not responsible for my sin. And none of us is responsible for the sins that were committed by some in this country 160 years ago. Slavery has not existed in this country for 158 years, if I'm doing my math right. No one today has ever been a slave. No one's father has ever been a slave. No one's grandfather has ever been a slave. No one's great-grandfather, probably not great-great-grandfather, has ever been a slave. And no one today has ever owned a slave. No one's father, no one's grandfather, no one's great-grandfather, maybe great-great-grandfather, has ever owned a slave. So reparations is an inherently unbiblical concept. It goes against biblical justice. The social justice view of economics with socialism, Marxism, and reparations stands in direct opposition to the clear biblical teaching on these subjects. It is anything but biblical justice. Anything but biblical justice. Ezekiel 18 verse 20. The soul who sins will die. The son will not bear the iniquity of the father nor will the father bear the iniquity of the son. The righteousness of the righteous will be upon himself, and the wickedness of the wicked will be upon himself. Okay. Now let's talk about critical race theory, the racial car of the social justice movement. There are few things more sensitive in our society today than the issue of race. I remember when I was in seminary, and this has been 25 years ago, I was watching the local news, and there was a, a stewardess on an airplane in the DFW airport, and this flight was getting ready to go. The passengers were on the plane, uh, but there was one passenger that didn't want to sit in his assigned seat. He wanted to sit in a different seat, and he was asking the stewardess, where can I sit? Where should I, you know, I, I want to go over here. When he was delaying the flight. But there were a few empty seats scattered around, and the stewardess, kind of frustrated by this guy not just getting a seat, she said off the top of her head, she said, any, many, miny, mo, pick a seat, we got to go. 
pretty clever, just off the top of our head. Any, many, miny, mo, pick a seat, we got to go. Well, apparently, that any, many, miny, mo, apparently, the origins of it are racial in their origin. I don't even know the exact nature of it, but apparently, that has some racial connotations to it. Who knew, right? But apparently, it did. And uh, he knew that, and he complained about it, and this stewardess lost her job. Lost her job for saying something like that. So innocent. Few things are more sensitive in this society than race. And everything now is racist. Roads are racist. Ice cream, if you can believe it or not, is racist. Bad news for our president that ice cream is racist. (laughs) Having order in your classroom is racist. Now, even being on time, apparently, is racist. Punctuality is racist. Everything today is is racist. This is some of the bad fruit born from critical race theory. Critical race theory. The origins of critical race theory go back to this gentleman. He's named Derek Bell, widely regarded as the father of the critical race theory. Um, In a periodical named after him, the Derek Bell Reader, author Richard Delgado writes this. He said, quote, critical race theory sprang up with the realization that the civil rights movement of the 1960s had stalled and needed new approaches to deal with the complex relationship among race, racism, and American law. Critical race theory is, quote, a collection of ideas of activists and scholars engaged in studying and transforming the relationship among race, racism, and power. Critical race theory questions the very foundations of liberal order including equality theory, legal reasoning, enlightenment, rationalism, and neutral principles of constitutional law. He continues, after the first decade of CRT, uh, it began to splinter and now includes a well-developed Asian American jurisprudence, a forceful Latino contingents, a feisty LGBT interest group, and now a Muslim and Arab caucus. Although the groups continue to maintain good relations under the umbrella of critical race theory, each has developed its own body of literature and set of priorities. At the heart of critical race theory is something known as intersectionality. You may have heard that term, intersectionality. Intersectionality is a concept developed by a woman named Kimberly Crenshaw. She was a former law professor at UCLA. And... uh, Michael Dumas, writing on Crenshaw's concept, says this, quote, Intersectionality has been advanced within CRT as a way to recapture the dynamic relationship between race and other differences, including gender, sexual identity, disability, and, of course, course, social class. So, in other words, the more minority categories you can identify with, the higher your intersectionality score. So if you're a white male, you, you can't claim any minority status. If you're a black male, you can claim at least your quote-unquote racial minority status. So you get a few points for being a black male. But if you're a black female, you get even more points because somehow females are considered a minority. Even though, even though they're literally half the population. But reality is not uh, really the standard when you're talking about critical race theory. So if you're a black female, you get more points than if you're simply a black male. But if you're a, if you're a lesbian black female, then you get some real points because that's another minority status that you can, you can claim. If you're a lesbian black two-spirited, transgender, trans-queer, queer one-legged disability person, then you get all kinds of intersectionality points. You know, then your score goes way up because you've got all these different minority statuses and you are really oppressed then. Uh, the man is, is weighing down on you. So you've got all these scores, all these points because you are so oppressed. And the more points you have, the more governmental aid you should be receiving and the more favored status uh, you can claim when you go, for, for example, to apply for a job. You're to be favored more 
even if you're not as qualified, you're to be favored more than someone who is qualified who doesn't check all of those boxes. And in critical race theory and the intersectionality, only white people can be racist. If you're not white, you cannot be racist by definition within CRT. Because the power of the systemically racist system lies, according to the CRT proponents, lies with white people. And because if you're white, you're part of this, this uh, empowered class, privileged class, uh, only you can be racist. Anybody else cannot be racist. It doesn't matter how much racism you may have in your heart. It doesn't matter if you're a member of the Black Panthers or the Black Hebrew Israelites, which are famously racist. Uh, that doesn't matter. You could, you could be holding up a sign on the street corner saying, I hate honkies, and you're still not going to be racist because you're a minority person. So the issue, according to CRT and intersectionality, is not what's in your heart. The issue is how much melanin you have in your skin and how many of these minority classes you can check the boxes from. Critical race theory was birthed in the late 1980s, and it is some of the bad fruit that was born from the poisonous Marxist ideology. According to the Handbook of Critical Race Theory in Education, the movement was, quote, composed predominantly of white neo-Marxist legal scholars and intellectuals who sought to expose and challenge the view that legal reasoning in America was neutral, values-free, and unaffected by social and economic relations, political forces, or cultural phenomena. For CRT proponents, the American law and legal institutions tend to serve to legitimize an oppressive social order. So in other words, in this country, all of the systems, the economic system, the judicial system, the penal system, everything is systematically, or systemically rather, racist. Racism is baked into the cake, and all of our institutions are racist. And dear friends, I will be the first to tell you that there are, uh, this is far from a perfect country, but by God's grace, I've traveled all over the world and, and I can tell you, the United States of America is one of the least racist countries you'll ever find. Our system of government uh, is one of the least racist systems that you'll find anywhere, except for now that the government is becoming increasingly increasing racist towards white people because we're the majority. And that doesn't work with CRT. Karl Marx was an admirer of this man. Y'all know who that guy is, right? Charles Darwin. Father of communism, Karl Marx was a great admirer of Charles Darwin. Marxism is at its core anti-theistic. There is no place for God in Marxism because in Marxism, Government is the highest authority. Of course, we as Christians understand that God is the highest authority, right? But not in Marxism. In Marxism, government is the highest authority. And so God is competition for Marxism. God must be dethroned in Marxism for government to hold the highest authority and to be unquestioned. According to Marxism, society is fundamentally flawed says that there is systemic injustice within society between the haves and the have-nots. John Frame, writing in his book titled A History of Western Philosophy and Theology, writes that according to Marxism, this systemic injustice, quote, cannot be solved until there is a radical change in the very nature of society. The means of production must be taken away from the rich capitalists, and given to the representatives of the poor. So Marx described religion, particularly Christianity, as an opiate, a kind of drug given to the poor by the rich to persuade them that revolution is not needed. 
under the influence of the opiate religion, they come to think that they will get their due reward through normal social change and eventually a reward in the sky by and by. So Marxists regard religion, especially Christianity, as a barrier to revolution and therefore a barrier to truly radical social change. Christianity has got to go. God must be dethroned. A strong belief in God and Marxism cannot coexist. That is why the Democratic Party today has virtually enshrined the sins of Romans chapter 1 into their party platform. That is why the Democratic Party is so against God and especially Christianity. That's why it's such a pagan party. And I'm not saying all Republicans are Christians at all on any level. Please understand that. But there is one party in this country that is stridently anti-God because the Democratic Party is a socialist slash Marxist slash blown communist party. And there is no room for God in that system. God must be dethroned. Marxism and critical race theory have as their goals the destruction of the current world as it exists and the creation of a new one. They are trying to, the Democratic Party today is trying to destroy our system and remake it, rebuild it in their own image. And in this new world, God must be destroyed. Man must be elevated. Race, dear friends, is a social construct, not a biological one. Hear me. Race is a social construct, not a biological construct. Even the term racism is something of a misnomer because there's only one race, right? There's only one race, the human race. There aren't different races. There is just one race. There are different ethnicities, but there is only one race. A man named Svant Pabo, he's the director of the Max Planck Institute for Evolutionary Anthropology. Okay, so no Christian, all right? This guy is an evolutionist, so he's not a Christian, but he's honest enough to state this, quote, what the study of complete genomes from different parts of the world has shown is that even between Africa and Europe, for example, there is not a single absolute genetic difference, meaning no single variant where all Africans have one variant and all Europeans another variant, even when recent migration is discarded. In other words, he is saying that there is absolutely no genetic difference between the quote unquote races. Race, race is a social construct, not a biological construct. Even secular people acknowledge this if they are intellectually honest. There's practically zero genetic difference between a black person and a white person. First Samuel chapter 16, 6 through 7, speaking of Samuel and his sons, says this, quote, when they entered, he looked at Eliab and thought, Surely the Lord's anointed is before him, before God. But the Lord said to Samuel, Do not look at his appearance or at the height of his stature, because I have rejected him. For God does not see as man sees, since man looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. God looks at the heart. Dear friends, it is only sinful man that looks at outward appearances and judges a man or a woman by his or her outward appearance. Only sinful men do that. God does not. God does not. Genesis chapter 3 verse 20 says, Now the man called his wife's name Eve because she was the mother of all living. Dear friends, I can trace my ancestry all the way back to Adam and Eve and so can you. So can you. All of us, regardless of our shades of skin, all of us can trace our ancestry back about 6,000 or so years ago to Adam and Eve. 
we are all the same race. So where did the different ethnicities come from? Well, Genesis chapter 11, the Tower of Babel. Verses 6 through 9 says this, Yahweh said, Behold, they are one people, and they all have the same language. And this is what they have begun to do. So now nothing which they purpose to do will be impossible for them. Come, let us go down. Notice the plural there, much like Genesis 1. Come, let us go down. And there confuse their language so that they will not understand one another's language. Now, just parenthetically here, just for a little Bible trivia, if you're ever asked where was the first example of speaking in tongues in the Bible, it's not the book of Acts. It's Genesis 11. And it wasn't a good thing. This was a sign of God's judgment. Speaking in tongues in Acts chapter 2 was a sign of God's judgment against unbelieving Israel. But that's, that's another subject matter. So Genesis chapter 11, the first example of speaking in tongues. So Yahweh scattered them from there over the face of the whole earth, and they stopped building the city. Therefore, its name was called Babel, because there Yahweh confused the language of the whole earth. And from there, Yahweh scattered them over the face of the whole earth. That is where the different ethnicities came from. But we are all of the same race. There is only one race. Critical race theory is designed to divide people. It is designed to divide people over things that simply do not matter, over levels of melanin in our skin. It's designed to destroy society so that it can be be remade in a Marxist world view. And sadly, what critical race theory and intersectionality is doing in the society at large, dividing us, it is also having the same effect even within the church. Men that five or seven years ago we never would have dreamed would imbibe the social justice ideology have done so, and it is causing division even within our tight theological circles. There's a kind of a internet personality named Kyle James Howard. Uh, Kyle James Howard is a a black man, and he used to be, actually many years ago, was a member of Paul Washer's church, and at the time was a really solid brother, and even downplayed racism. In fact, I've talked to people who knew him there at that church, and they said that uh, Kyle James Howard used to he would always make points like, why has everything got to be about race? You know, why, why do people talk about race? He was, he, had a, he was a very sound brother. But then somehow he got tossed to and fro, carried about by the winds of doctrine, the trickery of men regarding the social justice movement. And now for him, everything is about race. Everything. And he, is, he has written some of the most blatantly racist things that you've ever seen. He's one of the most racist individuals I've ever, I've ever come across. So this movement is making inroads into our circles. Let me give you an example of this. This is a man who used to be, and depending upon which group you find yourself, I suppose, still is, a heavy hitter within the Reformed theological camp, soteriologically. In other words, dealing with your salvation a high view of the sovereignty of God. This is Dr. Ligon Duncan. He's the chancellor of Reformed Theological Seminary in Jackson, Mississippi. And you see that thumbnail over there, Woke Church. Of course, that was written by Eric Mason, but Ligon Duncan wrote the foreword to Woke Church. Ligon Duncan used to be a solid guy, used to be a regular speaker at Shepherd's Conference, John MacArthur's church. But now he's been blown about by the winds of social justice. Listen to what he says here. Imagine the gospel impact if Bible-believing Protestants, Methodists, Baptists, Presbyterians had said of their Bible-believing Christian brothers and sisters in Baptist churches and elsewhere, you're you're not going to kill our brothers and sisters in Christ. You're not going to defraud our brothers and sisters in Christ. You're not going to wrongfully imprison our brothers and sisters in Christ. You're not going to mistreat our brothers and sisters. Can you imagine 
the gospel impact uh, of that. Um, and, you know, it's going to take us 100 years to overcome the trust issues that have come out of that. He says it's going to take us 100 years to overcome the trust issues that have come out of that. You see, understand this, dear friends, the social justice movement is a perpetual state of grievances. The end game to the social justice movement is that there is no end game. The end game is that there is no end game. There is no forgiveness in the social justice movement. He says that his friends have a hard time trusting him. Watch this. You know, I, I, I tell people my very best black friends have trouble trusting me for really good reasons. Because people like me... Um, have been doing awful things to them and to their families for four centuries. So his black friends have a hard time trusting him because of what people like him have done to black people in, in centuries gone by? You see, there is no forgiveness. There's just this perpetual state of victimhood. And dear friends, if you can, if you can convince someone that he is a victim... That is the surest way to inoculate that person against the gospel. If you see yourself as a victim, you will never come to Christ. Dear friends, we are not victims. We are transgressors, transgressors of the law of God. But within the social justice movement, as long as you're not white, that is, you're a victim. You're not responsible for your own shortcomings. It's not your fault. It's what the man has done to me. It's what the systemically racist society has done to me. I'm not responsible for my sins. I can't help it. I'm oppressed. If you see yourself as a victim, I don't care what shade of skin you have, you will never come to Christ. You will never come to Christ. And what a profoundly unbiblical thing for Ligon Duncan to say. Ligon Duncan has never been a slave owner. His father was not a slave owner. His grandfather was not a slave owner. His great-grandfather was not a slave owner. But you see, there is no forgiveness in this movement. And he says his, his black friends have trouble trusting him. I don't know that that's true, but let's just say it is. If that is true, if Ligon Duncan has black friends, brothers in Christ, men who claim to be Christians who have trouble trusting him, another brother in Christ, then he needs to go to his black friends, check, check, he needs to go to his black friends and confront them in their sin because they're holding him responsible for something that he did not do, his father didn't do, his grandfather didn't do, his great-grandfather didn't do. That's sinful. You see, social justice, critical race theory, intersectionality, it comes in and it creates division. It builds up walls of division that the cross of Christ has already ground to powder. But this movement wants to build them back up. Because God must be dethroned. It is horrifically, horrifically unbiblical. Watch this video clip from Vody Balkum. I love this. It does two things here that are incredibly important. One is it identifies the distinctions that matter. And secondly, it identifies the division that exists. Now, these distinctions that matter are important because oftentimes we talk about distinctions and we talk about being distinct from one another in terms of our race. Race is actually a social construct. The concept of race is not a biblical concept. It's not a biblical idea. It is a constructed idea. You won't find the idea of races in the Bible unless you find it in the proper historical context where we see, number one, that we are all the race of Adam. Amen? 
what one race, one blood. We are all the race of Adam. There is less than a 0.2% genetic difference between any of us in this regard. In fact, we're not even different colors. Amen. Technically, from a genetic perspective, from a biochemistry perspective, we're all actually the same color. Our color comes from our melanin. We've all got melanin just to differing degrees. So it's not that some of us are, you know, this color, some of us are that color, some of, no, we're just different shades of the same color. Some of us just have more melanin than others, and I want you to, listen to me on this, listen to me. Just because you don't have as much melanin as I do, don't you dare think God doesn't love you as much as he loves me because he gave me more. I love that. Dear friends, we are all of one race. Races don't reconcile. Sinners must be reconciled to God. And so many people today clamoring for social justice. I want justice. I want justice. Be very careful when you say you want justice. Because I can assure you, dear friends, Nobody in here wants justice. Because if God gave us what we truly deserve, he would give us hell. That would be just of God to give us what our sins have earned us. Races don't reconcile. Sinners must be reconciled to God. One of the great blessings that has been mine as an evangelist is I have been able to preach the gospel now in 30, 30, 31 different countries. I've preached on every continent except Antarctica. No immediate plans to go preach to the penguins. So I'll probably not be able to scratch that one off my bucket list. But everywhere else, pretty much, I've been to. And it does not matter what country I'm in. It doesn't matter what culture I'm in. It doesn't matter what language is spoken. It doesn't matter how much they have or how little they have. When I am with like-minded believers in Christ, there is an instant bond there, an instant fellowship there, an instant love there, because we're family. We're family. And it certainly does not matter how much or how little melanin we have in our skin. I can meet someone for the first time in my life, but if I'm with a like-minded brother and sister in Christ, there is just an instant bond. I love them. And they love me. Why? Because we're family. We're family. We have been adopted into the family of God through the merits of Christ. And all these other things don't matter. The gospel shatters all of these inconsequential differences. But it is these worldly, godless ideologies that are trying to build up those walls that Christ's cross has already smashed and ground to powder. The greatest need that you and I have is to be reconciled to God. To God. And I just want to close with the gospel. Has there been a time in your life when you have been convicted by the Holy Spirit of God that you are a sinner? Far from being a victim... You're a rebel. You're a transgressor. You're a lawbreaker. You have broken the laws of God, the Ten Commandments. Thou shalt not lie. Have you ever told a lie? Of course you have. So have I. A lot of them. Thou shalt not steal. If you have ever taken something that does not belong to you, you're a thief. The value of what you take is irrelevant. 
Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain. If you have ever taken God's name in an irreverent way, that is blasphemy. And dear friends, we blaspheme God's name not only in word but in deed. Thou shalt not commit adultery. Don't let yourself off the hook too quickly. Because Jesus says if you look at a woman with lust, you've committed adultery already in your heart. If you have ever looked at another person with lust, you're an adulterer. We have all broken God's laws thousands of times. We have sinned against him in word, in deed, and in thought. And just like when we break laws on earth, there's a penalty to be paid. How much more so when we break the laws of God? But because we have sinned against God who is eternal and of infinite value, the punishment of that sin is also eternal and it is also infinite. And if we die in our sins, we will very rightly and very justly go to a very real place where the Bible calls hell, that the Bible calls hell. The worm will not die. The fire will not be quenched. There will be wailing, weeping, gnashing of teeth. The full undiluted fury of God's wrath will be poured out on the unrepentant for all of eternity and that horror will never end ever that would be justice that's what you and I deserve but there is good news and the good news of the gospel is this is that God has made a way to escape his righteous wrath. God sent his son, Jesus Christ, to this earth. And Jesus lived a perfect life, never broke any of God's laws. He lived a life of perfect satisfaction to God the Father. And this one man, the God-man, Jesus Christ, truly God, truly man, one man, one person with two natures, this God-man willingly laid down his life on the cross. His life was not taken. He gave it. And on the cross, this perfect person offered his perfect life as a perfect sacrifice to perfectly satisfy the perfect wrath of God. Three days later, bodily raised from the dead, proving himself to be who he said he was, God in human flesh. And the reconciliation that needs to take place is you being reconciled to God. You must have a righteousness that you don't have, that I don't have. We have no righteousness on our own. We must have the righteousness of someone else. And his name is Jesus. And his righteousness is imputed to us, is counted towards us when we repent of sin, turn from sin, and place our trust in what he accomplished for us on Calvary's tree. We cannot work our way into heaven. There is no amount of good works that you can do to overcome the debt that your sin has incurred against God. There's no amount of good works you can do. Your works, as Isaiah says, is as filthy rags before a thrice holy God. Lay your works down. They will profit you nothing. But if you will turn from sin and trust in what Jesus accomplished on the cross, your sin imputed to him, God the Father treated Christ as though he were a sinner, even though he was not. His wrath burned against the sin of his people and was satisfied in the atoning work of Christ on the cross. Your sins imputed to him, his righteousness imputed to you. And if you will come to Christ seeking not only a Savior from hell, which is good and right, but also a Savior from sin, just as much as we should want a Savior from hell, we should want a Savior from sin. Does your sin grieve you? Do you grieve over your sin because you understand that your sin grieves God? The person who wants a savior from hell because his conscience convicts him but not a savior from sin has a savior from neither. But if you will come to Christ 
truly sorrowing over your sin, trusting in him and him alone, he will save you. Jesus says, the one who comes to me, I will in no wise cast out. Turn from your sin. Place your trust in Jesus. He will save you. You will pass from death to life. The wrath of God removed. Your heart of stone replaced with a heart of flesh. And you will be reconciled to God. Adopted into his family. And Jesus himself will be our for all of eternity. That is the good news of the gospel. Let's close in a word of prayer. Father, we thank you that you have broken down the barriers that would seek to divide, that the power of your cross has crushed these things to powder. Lord, may we, be, may we have a renewed confidence in your word, in the sufficiency of your word. May we go to war against these godless ideologies that would seek to dethrone you. And Father, above all, I pray that as your gospel has been preached tonight, I pray that your Holy Spirit would do his work, would convict of sin, righteousness, and judgment, convict of the truth of the gospel. Lord, if there be any lost sheep here tonight who have not yet heard the voice of the shepherd, call them. May they go to the shepherd and find rest. All for the glory of our King. It's in his name we pray.